from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Looking for answers. The big thing is just the uncertainty that this has created. Farmers take a deeper dive into the war in Ukraine and how it could impact their operations. It's the new hot commodity. See where producers are turning as the global fertilizer supply crunch grows. Higher commodity prices increasing demand. Uh, that would be a net reduction in CRP of around one and a half million acres. Farmers are rethinking many of those acres previously set aside for conservation right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Tyne Morgan. Clinton is on vacation. Well, more acres in the U.S. could be going back into production. The Ag Secretary says only 1.8 million of the 4 million expiring CRP acres are being re-enrolled in the program. Tom Vilsack saying in a call with reporters while in Mexico that sign-up ended March 11th for the General Conservation Reserve Program. He also said new contracts on around 800,000 acres would be offered. It adds up to a net reduction in CRP of around 1.5 million acres. Vilsack says the numbers prove there is no reason for him to open CRP for emergency cropping. I asked Farm Journal Washington analyst Jim Wiesmeyer about that. I think he said the best policy response he could have given from my perspective when he said, quote, the market basically responds to signals and the farmers are making the decision. In other words, he doesn't want to go into the CRP and uh, make a decision to uh, have farmers bail out of those uh, contracts. Uh, he's saying let the market determine that. And uh, I think the, uh, the conservationist in town and in the country would applaud him for that because uh, uh, the CRP, it's not something you want to go into and out of too frequently. Wiesmeyer says this will be a topic in the upcoming Farm Bill debate. He says former House Ag Committee Chairman Colin Peterson pushed for Congress to re-examine the definition of what qualifies for the Conservation Reserve Program and he thinks that is a legitimate topic for the upcoming Farm Bill debate. Well, as we said, Secretary Vilsack traveled to Mexico. There he met with his Mexican counterpart, announcing that the Mexican market will soon reopen to U.S. table stock and shipping potatoes. USDA also saying that the secretaries also reaffirmed their commitment to promoting food security through trade, continuing rural development, helping small producers and new farmers, tackling climate issues, and safeguarding plant and animal health. The secretary also commenting on the avian influenza outbreak right now, saying he does not expect major export losses for U.S. poultry producers because of it. The outbreak has spread now to 24 states. But Vilsack says the restrictions have been limited to poultry raised in those affected counties or states. He said there has not been an effort to do a nationwide restriction. Nearly 23 million chickens and turkeys have already been killed across the U.S. He says improvements in biosecurity since the major outbreaks in 2014 and 2015 have helped limit the spread. Well, keeping you updated on the situation in Ukraine, the Ukrainian president is accusing Russia of using hunger as a weapon. He claims Russian forces are deliberately targeting the country's essential food supplies. In an address to Irish lawmakers, he said Russian forces, quote, are destroying things that are sustaining livelihoods, end quote. He said that includes food storage depots. He also says Russian forces are blocking ports so Ukraine cannot export food. He says they are also putting mines into farm fields. He is accusing Russia of deliberately provoking a food crisis in Ukraine, which we've been reporting is a major global producer of staples, including wheat and sunflower oil. Well, ships also seem to be having some issues getting out of ports in China due to rising COVID cases in Shanghai. With congestion at ports there and elsewhere around the world, gridlocking about 10% of the global container ship fleet. That's according to shipping line Ocean Network Express. But there are some hopeful signs. Shipping rates between China and the U.S. East and West coasts are on the decline. In fact, one global supply chain company reports prices have been dropping since January. It reports West Coast rates have dropped by 52 percent, East Coast rates by 50 percent. Company leaders say it's due to a decrease in sales and full inventories. And progress continues to be made on the West Coast when it comes to the backlog of ships. The Marine Exchange of Southern California reporting 92 ships at the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. 29 are container ships. 
But what about moving U.S. ag out of the country? USDA reports exports totaled more than $15 billion in February. That's down $264 million from January, but still $1.75 billion above February 2021 levels. Ag imports declined to $14.4 billion. That resulted in a trade surplus of $1.22 billion for the month. Well, with the fights for fertilizer on around the world, one old-fashioned method is a hot commodity right now. We're talking about manure. Reuters reporting some livestock and dairy farmers have found a fertile side business selling it to grain growers. So are businesses that make manure spreading equipment. Business is so good that some cattle feeders that sell it report they are sold out through the end of the year. Some even have waiting lists. Ag specialists say while manure can help make up some of the difference in the nutrient shortfall, it isn't a fix-all. They say there's not enough supply, transportation is expensive, and the prices for manure are also rising thanks to that strong demand. Plus, it is highly regulated. Well, dangerous weather tearing through the south again this week near Savannah, Georgia. A tornado and severe thunderstorms turned deadly. Three hours inland, there is more destruction, and closer to Dallas, there was flash flooding. Other parts of the country are still dealing with snow. Meteorologist Matt Yurisavik joins us with an update. Yeah, that's right, Tyne. We've got some cooler air bringing in some more wintry weather as we head deeper into the month of April. So if we take a look at the jet stream here, much like yesterday, looking ahead towards Friday where we've got kind of a cutoff low sitting over the Great Lakes and the Midwest. That's going to bring some colder air to the north, chillier air down into parts of the Ohio Valley, but back to the west, a very big ridge is forming. That's bringing warmer air all the way up into Montana and southern parts of Canada. Meanwhile, it's going to be hot and dry back in the southwest. So that's the overall pattern heading into Friday and even Saturday. Once that moves east, well, then things will get a little bit warmer in the east. But comes with a chance for a little bit of that snow. Some uh, a couple inches could be possible in northern portions of the Great Lakes and then a couple inches of higher elevation snow back in the west as we start off next week. So it doesn't look like the snow is going away anytime soon, at least for the next week or two. Then if we look here at future track, we've got kind of a zoomed in on this cutoff low over the Great Lakes, bringing colder air in through the northwest. That's going to bring snow showers to Duluth down toward Minneapolis and eventually bring that colder air even farther to the south. Places like Chicago, down even to Detroit and Green Bay could see some of those snow showers as we head through Friday afternoon and into the start of Saturday. And in other parts of the country, the weather is cooperating to get a little planting started. Eric Ramirez sharing this video in Leveland, Texas, west of Lubbock. He says corn planting is underway at his farm. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Well, it seems like we just had a big report in prospective plantings from USDA, and on Friday we get another one, the latest supply and demand report from USDA. I talk with Joe Baklovic about what he will be watching. And later, farmers here and around the world are watching the situation in Ukraine, how producers in one state are arming themselves with information that's in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator, it's not just any closing wheel. Reach your yield potential. Pre-order by April 30th with coupon code AGDAY for $2 shipping per wheel. Corn futures trading lower midweek as the market moved towards a correction, with traders keeping an eye on the Russia-Ukraine war and Friday's supply and demand report from USDA. Here's more from a trader with the CME. The soybeans were a little bit lower that COVID-19 cases are really on the rise in China and uh, from that report out of Shanghai that that would really impact demand and so there was a little concern about that so we had a little bit of a reversal from yesterday. Uh, however, China is back from holiday so if they're going to step in and buy we're still waiting to see. Um, right now the option skew kind of popped up uh, to 2.17. And I think that's just an indication that there's a possibility that uh, the market is ready to make a move here. And of course, we're going to be watching weather as we go forward. Joe Vaklovic with Standard Grain joining us now. Joe, some volatility to the mostly upside to begin the week. But what is the driver of commodity prices right now? I think the corn market, to some extent, is still adjusting to that acreage number. 
Uh, that acreage number in corn that USDA provided us with last week is a very, very supportive number in itself if it's realized. When you start to do some early balance sheet work for new crop, it's, it's a very tight situation, even with a trend yield. If you were to throw some sort of weather issue into the mix, it, it becomes an incredibly tight, incredibly friendly situation. It's, we're in one of these environments now where like the corn market in particular looks almost impossibly bullish. Like there's just nothing that can hurt it. It's bulletproof. That bothers me a little bit because whenever you get like extremely tilted one way or the other, a lot of times that'll result in, you know, a top in the market or a bottom in the market. I can recall May 2020 when USDA told us we were going to have a 3.3 billion bushel carryout. You know, one of the most bearish projections we've ever seen. Corn was at three bucks and that was about the bottom of the market for the most part. So uh, these estimates and projections can change. But for right now, the stuff that's on paper uh, leads you to a pretty friendly uh, scenario in regard to corn in particular. Well, speaking of USDA, as we head into the WASDE report on Friday, do you expect any big revisions on that balance sheet? So it's, it is an old crop report, so they're not going to give us new crop balance sheets. We don't see those until the May report, which I believe is May 12th. Uh, the stuff to keep an eye on would be, uh, you know, U.S. demand. I mean, ethanol feed, uh, soybean crush, soybean exports, all that sort of stuff. Um, you can look for the Ukraine-Russia situation to be adjusted a little bit. USDA adjusted some of those numbers last month, but... Um, uh, I'd, I'll be curious to see if they make additional revisions this month. It's, it's such an impossible task that USDA has trying to estimate or project exactly how that situation is going to play out. Uh, South American production would be another thing. Uh, the Brazilian corn crop, that second corn crop in Brazil, is actually going to end up being really good the way that it looks. Uh, the soybean crop, however, is, is, you know, they're almost done harvesting beans in Brazil. It's going to be quite a bit lighter than expected. I, I think USDA has to come down with that estimate a little bit. So keep an eye on those South American numbers numbers as well. All right. Thanks, Joe. And of course, we will have complete coverage from WASD Monday morning right here on Ag Day. All right. Let's take a quick break. Getting in that casual planting forecast next. For more information about Standard Grain and its services, call Joe at 312-462-4438. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's April 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik is back with us. Matt, talk about an active jet stream. We're seeing a bit of everything right now. Yeah, Ty, that's right. We've got a very active jet stream. We've had one now for the past week and still some cooler air coming into uh, really the upper Midwest and into the Great Lakes. That's bringing with it some chance for some late season snowflakes. Meanwhile, in the west, a ridge building that's going to bring some warmer air in as we head through the end of the week. But look at this. We've got a cutoff low here right over the Great Lakes. That's going to bring some shower activity and the chance for some of those snowflakes to mix in. By the time we get through the weekend, though, that is up and out of here, and you can actually see some of that warmth move over into some of those places that did see the colder air. But back in the northwest, we've got a Another dip in the jet stream, which is eventually going to produce some more active weather as we head through next week. And it looks like right here, a storm strengthening right across the center of the country next week could actually bring the chance for a uh, severe weather threat next week. So that's something that we'll have to keep our eyes on there for parts of the middle of the country, not necessarily the Gulf Coast, but a different area there could be looking at severe weather by next week. So here's a look at our uh, map here showing you a system riding up this cold front in the East Coast. And there's that cutoff low with high pressure in control back to the west. And this is really the only show in town as this front exits off the east coast. Just this front keeps spinning over the Great Lakes. You can see those snow showers mixing in on the backside. Meanwhile, back to the west, that's where high pressure is in control and will continue to be until the second half of the weekend. And once this moves eastward, then it gets warmer and we'll slowly start to see that sunshine return. But over the next 10 days, a very active jet stream continues and that means more rain right where we've seen a lot of it, but also some back there in the northern Rockies. Some higher elevation snow could also move in by next week. So here's a look at those temperatures as we head through uh, really tomorrow morning. It's going to be chilly across most of the lower 48 tomorrow afternoon chilly across the east here and warmer back in the west. Phoenix could top out in the mid 90s. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live.
York, Pennsylvania, mild with showers, likely a high of 57 degrees, 38 with rain and snow showers in Hayward, Wisconsin, and heading to Caldwell, Idaho, sunny and warm, a high of 70 degrees. Drover's Report on Ag Day is brought to you by Long Range Epidemectin. If you're committed to peak performance, there's only one choice for your dewormer, Long Range Epidemectin. It's the first and only dewormer to offer up to 150 days of parasite control in one convenient dose. Well, the new CME group, Purdue University Ag Economy Barometer, says the biggest concern among producers right now continues to be higher input costs. As we reported yesterday, the index dipped to a reading of 113 in March. That's 12 points lower than the previous month. Researchers asking farmers what their biggest concerns are right now, and the report shows the livestock prices are also a concern. 41% of producers in this month's survey said high input prices were their number one concern. And that was followed by availability of inputs at 19%, as well as low crop or livestock prices also at 19%. When asked how the war in Ukraine will impact U.S. ag, producers overwhelmingly said input prices would be the most impacted. That's followed by crop prices and then livestock prices. Well, drought conditions also weighing heavy on the minds of many cattle producers right now, and it's causing California ranchers to make some changes. The annual movement of cattle to summer grazing pastures is starting earlier than usual in the state this year as drought dries up winter forage lands. Ranchers faced with diminishing grazing lands are also paying a premium to buy and deliver hay. California Farm Bureau reports with spiking fuel costs and mounting time pressures. Ranchers' costs are also climbing for lining up cattle trucks to transport livestock to still serviceable summer pasture areas. Well, the war in Ukraine hits home as farmers here look for answers on the impact a war thousands of miles away could have on their operation. That's in the country. Closed captioning on Ag Day is brought to you by BASF, helping you do the biggest job on earth. Well, we see the images coming out of Ukraine of war-torn cities and the impact on us emotionally. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine is also impacting our daily lives with higher energy and food prices. As Charles Denny reports, the impact is also being felt on farmers here and around the world. A packed room at UT's Howard Baker Center for Public Policy, expert professors talking about this war. Questions from the crowd, why is Russia doing this? How long could this conflict last? And what can we do to help the people of Ukraine? Other topics touched on here included how this war could create further economic hardships in our country. We just want to supply some information that's more narrowly focused and give our perspectives as specialists in these fields. So I'm a political scientist. We'll be talking about, I'll be talking about the geopolitical angle of the conflict. Ukraine and Russia are huge agricultural nations. These two countries supply about 30% of the world's grain. As the war goes on into the spring planting season, it will impact food prices and agriculture all over the world, including here in the U.S. The big thing is just the uncertainty that this has created. Aaron Smith and Andrew Muhammad are with Agricultural and Resource Economics at UT's Institute of Agriculture. As they monitor the conflict, they're watching the effect on commodity prices and input costs for our farmers. In addition to growing crops, Russia is one of the world's largest fertilizer producers. And when you look at it from an agricultural standpoint, increased fuel prices during the spring planting season is another added cost to production. Obviously with their contributions to uh, global fertilizer production out of Russia, that's going to have some impacts. Mohammed says American farmers were already facing sky-high fertilizer and fuel costs even before this invasion. And now in particular, the potassium fertilizer supply could be a concern. Canada accounts for two-thirds of that, but Russia and Belarus accounts for about a third or a little less. And you can imagine those supplies drying up, what it's going to further do to fertilizer prices. Yeah, not only did it make it worse, it almost makes it appear that there's no relief in sight. The war in Ukraine is heartbreaking and impactful. There will be economic consequences for some time to come in our home life 
and on the farm. This is Charles Denny reporting. Thanks, Charles. The UTIA ag economists are recommending Tennessee farmers protect themselves with crop insurance and for everyone to watch out for possible cyber attacks. Well, that's all the time we have this morning. Thank you for watching. From all of us at Ag Day, I'm Tyne Morgan. Have a great day in farm country.